Dr. Cody, welcome to the Nailed It Ortho podcast. We have uh, been looking forward to this talk on total knees for a while. So welcome to the podcast. Thanks for taking the time out to come on. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, and of course, no problem. And we generally kind of start off with um, just some questions, getting to know you uh, as a person, and then we'll jump into the, the case and kind of the talk of the day. Uh, but the first question I have for you is kind of just an age-old question, is kind of what brought you or, or steered you towards doing joints or arthroplasty or adult reconstruction? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. I had uh, some hesitancy in getting into joint replacement. I actually submitted my application pretty late because I enjoyed doing a lot of different things in orthopedics. I liked trauma. I liked sports. Um, and for a time, I thought I was going to be interested in doing spine. Um, ultimately, what led me to joint replacement was uh, I realized that I like big surgery, I like successful surgery, um, and I really felt that uh, the ins and outs of joint replacement, uh, it was something that I felt I enjoyed reading about every day. Um, so, you know, I, I thought the clinic was uh, manageable. The decision making just you know matched with sort of how I like to do things, um, and it, I really am in this uh, staff now for over four years, and and every time I'm in the operating room, I, I have a lot of fun, uh, and so I think that's what gives you that professional satisfaction if you're doing what you love, and uh, it's something that you can read about and learn about, and you're excited to learn new things and 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 try new things. Um, I think that's what keeps you excited and gives you that uh, professional satisfaction for a long term uh, in your career. So I think, you know, the advice I give all of our residents um, is that, you know, choose something that you may enjoy doing a lot of different things. You got to think about, um, you know, the complications you're comfortable dealing with. You got to think about your bread and butter cases, other cases that excite you still or cases that you enjoy doing. Um, and then, you have to think about uh, clinic, honestly, um, and, and, and whether or not you uh, enjoy things about the nuances of a sports exam um, or, uh, you know, the subtleties of a spine exam, things like that. Uh, for me, I really liked uh, everything about joint replacement, so I figured why not specialize and do that alone for my career. So, so far, I've, uh, I've been very pleased with that decision. Yeah. And it's becoming more and more uh, competitive every year. And I think, you know, more people going into it uh, from, you know, I think between sports and joints, those are some of the things that you see a lot of residents going into most years. What, what are some of the things you would recommend to some of your residents or residents that, you know, may, that you may mentor? What are some of the things they can do to be successful at matching into fellowship for joints? I think, I think uh, having a, a good breadth of experience is, is great because um, you know, doing as many cases as you can, it gives you something to talk about. Um, it really allows you to discuss why you are choosing a given specialty um, on your interview trail. I think research is very important. Uh, again, it gives you something to talk about. Um, I think a lot of fellowships are interested in, in having some research opportunities, uh, at least knowing that you know how to do research. Um, some fellowships are heavier uh, in research as far as mandating that you do some research. Uh, others are, are less uh, interested in that, but um, I do think that it does help somewhat differentiate people. Um, I don't think that you need to have 15 peer-reviewed studies to match into joints, but uh, if you have five to 10, it certainly helps. Um, I think that, uh, especially if you're interviewing people that have not rotated through uh, your hospital, those are just the things that can uh, help you stand apart. Um, those are just uh, a few of the things that I that I have. You know, it's, we have a lot of, um, I don't really interview for fellowship and stuff, but it's, you know, we interview for residents all the time. And um, I just want people to be themselves. Uh, and I want uh, people to, uh, I, I want to take residents on that we enjoy working with and are going to work hard and do well. And, and a lot of that comes down to being a good person and being a good resident, having good letters of recommendation and things that everybody should do regardless of your specialty. Um, I think the one thing that you can do if you have the opportunity to get involved in some high quality research, uh, it doesn't have to be a lot, but a little bit, I think that, that can help kind of push you over the edge, especially as, as you mentioned, uh, 
the interview trail is getting more and more competitive for joints. Um, fortunately, I snuck in right before it started getting competitive, I guess. But uh, I think um, it is definitely uh, a desired specialty. So that's what I'd recommend. Absolutely. Yeah, I was just talking to uh, one of my seniors about, you know, you know, some of the specialties that you actually might have a chance of not matching it as far as, you know, into fellowship. And uh, yeah, Joyce was kind of on the list just because of how competitive his has become over the you know last few years. But um, definitely was some good tips that you dropped for everybody who's interested in that. Um, I think I would also say I would also say it kind of cast a wide net too. Um, there's a lot of fellowships out there, um, and uh, if you are a conscientious person and you go to a good fellowship, you're gonna and, a, and a, you're a good surgeon. You go to a good fellowship, you're gonna be a good surgeon. Uh, if you're a, if you're a good surgeon and you it, even if you go to a fellowship that's not in your top five or top six choices, um, you will still learn a lot at that fellowship, mm-hmm. and you're gonna come out as a really good surgeon. So um, wherever you you know. Don't just uh, you know, don't don't cast a, a narrow net. And I think casting a wide net is a very uh, wise thing to do when you're applying to a specialty like joints. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I, uh, I I use that I use that uh, same uh, strategy for most of the most things when it's time to apply med school, residency, all that good stuff. I'm like, yeah, let's uh, right. cast a broad net and just see how things go. Uh, right. Doctor Cody, we're gonna get going with the case here and I have we, we have a case here it's a 70 year old male with a history of a right total knee uh, uh, due to osteoarthritis that he got three years ago he coming into the office with pain he was previously pain free so this particular case it is more so you know we, we also have a YouTube video this is something for for those individuals just to have an idea of what someone may come in with uh, but if possible we can probably still keep it somewhat broad and just talk about dealing with uh, total knee, arthroplasty, and, and knee pain. Uh, so just pretty much the painful knee out there, arthroplasty. So, well, you know, when, when we first started talking and you were asking me about uh, the things that you have to deal with in your specialty that maybe aren't your favorite thing to deal with, this is one of those things that when someone comes to your clinic with a painful total knee, especially when it was done by somebody else, everyone sort of takes a collective groan big sigh and then you you know look at the x-rays and go in the room and kind of you try to figure out what's going on because the problem is there are some painful knees that are they're just painful um you don't always know why someone has pain after knee replacement um you know seven eight percent of people uh, in some series even higher will just have unexplained knee pain after knee replacement surgery and we've tried to do all sorts of things to decrease that number with kinematic alignment and uh you know, uh, narrow sizing and, and even patient specific instrumentation and implants and all that sort of thing. But we never really can quite crack that code. Uh, there are just some people that have a painful total knee. So um, I would say that uh, this is probably one of those things that not everybody enjoys doing, but it's a very important part of uh, orthopedic practice. So I think it's important to have a good idea of what you need to look for and, and, and ways that uh, you can make sure. Um, you know, people aren't, you're not getting yourself into trouble, but uh, also just to, to understand some things that could be going wrong and, and things you could do to really help people out. Not all of those things require revision surgery. So um, if someone had a previously well-functioning total knee, especially for three years, um, you know, I think that regardless of when they come to you, if someone has a new pain in a knee replacement that is not getting better, they feel like they're particularly if they things like worse than they were before surgery, um, even without any constitutional symptoms, the first thing I want to do is rule out infection. Um, I think that the, the fork in the road when you first see a painful knee replacement is, is this infected or is it not infected? And things that you can look at, you know, as you have listed here, things like pain, new stiffness. So if someone had great range of motion and all of a sudden they've lost range of motion, um, that to me can be indicative of infection. Um, People who say things like, you know, the knee was never quite right, uh, those, are, those are concerning for some um, low virulent infections. Um, things like wound healing complications early on after surgery. Um, yeah, my wound drained for five or six days and my surgeon put me on, you know, Keflex. That, that's concerning that they might have a deep infection. Um, and then 
patients that have uh, multiple surgeries previously, um, younger patients actually, uh, they all are a little bit higher risk for infection. Then you have your known infection risk, people who are smokers, obesity, diabetes. Um, those people have got to be very uh, rheumatoids or any other uh, autoimmune disorder type patients. Those are the patients you got to be on high alert for when it comes to uh, infection. So, um, let's, uh, yeah. So, one of the things that um, infection usually, it, it's usually pain sort of throughout a range of motion, unexplained pain, pain with sort of everything. There's not a particular function that is painful, but sort of all functions are painful. Um, so you want to get an idea about that, but some of the things, uh, the other the other common reason why knee replacements we say fail or patients will come in with, with pain is, is loosening of the implant, so aseptic loosening. So two most common ways that total knees fail uh, is infection, number one, and aseptic loosening, number two. Um, aseptic loosening, uh, you can see things like uh, startup pain. That's a very classic sign, um, and uh, it can People can have instability that is a little less common than you do see it, um, but you want to make sure that you're critically evaluating your radiographs, particularly serial radiographs, so if you have an immediate post-op x-ray, and then you can evaluate an x-ray at six months or one year or two years, and you can see if there's a change in implant position with time that is absolutely diagnostic of, of implant loosening. Um, and then uh, things that uh, you want to know, again, you, you listed your acute worsening versus uh, and constant pain. So if someone says, you know, I was doing great, and then all of a sudden, I couldn't walk on this knee. I can't bend it. I can't range it. Um, I know, by the way, I'm having fevers. <laughs> that yeah. thing you've got to be concerned about periprosthetic joint infection. Right. Um, so I think, again, you know, with all these bullet points and all these history and physical exam things you're asking, um, what, the first thing I will do is, is, is ask the questions to see if they're, if they're infected. And if I have no lab values, um, or if I, um, un, they have an unclear history, like they have a history of a procedure, or a recent dental procedure, or some other procedure, um, or a recent hospitalization, or other type of infection, um, that I will proceed with lab evaluation uh, at that visit. Uh, yeah. And so it seems like, once again, this is another, another time where you can really get a lot just from the history of yeah. what's going on it can mm -hmm. really lead you down the right path to kind of what's going on and, and get to the to the you know to what you're trying to find as far as what's causing this pain right. uh right. I mean, every these... total knee replacement that has pain that comes to you doesn't need esr and crp right away it doesn't need to be aspirated i mean if someone says i have pain only when i go downstairs or um you know they feel they they some patients will discuss symptoms of instability you know when i you know, when I move laterally, I feel like my knee shifts and it's painful. And I don't like that. I mean, that's typically not an infection picture. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, they, they will discuss symptoms of patellar instability. Uh, and that's not necessarily indicative of infection. Now, I will, in the, if you're talking about revision surgery, I will get laboratory evaluation ahead of time, but I'm not going down that, that side of the fork in the road uh, towards infection. So, um, the history can definitely paint uh, the, the picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's, uh, and you, you know, you're talking about things like osteolysis and polyethylene, where unless you have um, some sort of real mechanical complication um, or some sort of third body wear, like retained uh, piece of cement in the knee or something like that, wear, polyethylene wear is not really something that you're going to see unless someone comes in with new pain and the knee is around 10 to 12 years old or so um, or older. Um, so something that you has, find pretty late, pretty much. Yeah, and and um, and it's not. We just don't see it as often with more modern implants and more modern um, polyethylene. Uh, and, and, and I'm I'm glad you mentioned that because it's something I keep in mind when when we're doing these questions for the you know in training exam and mm -hmm. ortho bullets and things like that. It actually. Actually, so a lot, maybe not all the time, but a lot of times it, it follows something like that. I mean, usually when they're trying to get you to go towards osteolysis, the person didn't get the implant two years ago. It, it's been a while, right. you know, it's been right. eight years, 10 years, you know, it's been a, a extended period of time when they're trying to kind of hit you towards that path. Um, yeah, when you're talking about high yield things for the, for the test purposes, which is, you know, not everyone that's listening is going to go into joint replacement, um, but you know, everyone's going to be taking a test at some point uh, that's uh, going to determine whether or not you get to sit for your boards and, um, you know, and, and for the interning exam, keep you out of trouble with your residency. And I think that, 
the high yield topics are things like that are very radiographically obvious, things like loosening, things like osteolysis, and they like those types of questions. And you're absolutely right. They'll the the, the test writers will generally give you a clue as they have well functioning knee 12 to 15 years ago comes in with new onset pain and they'll either show you you know wear and do osteolysis with asymmetrical polyethylene wear um, with large uh, you know osteolytic lesions or they'll show you a frankly loose component and then they ask you about things about how to reconstruct uh, those types of defects if uh, you were to do a revision knee I think those are fair game questions absolutely uh, but you're but you're right I, I think you know the infection picture they're gonna they're it's usually not going to be um, it's not going to be vague. If it's an infection picture, they're going to give you the information to, to clue you into the fact that it's infected. Okay. Absolutely. And, and we probably, you know, you actually mentioned some of this along the way, uh, but can we just briefly go through some of the physical exam things you're sure. looking for as well when these patients come in? Yeah, the, the biggest thing I look for is uh, you evaluate the knee to see if uh, there's a large effusion. You know, people have effusions up to about a year. Um, you know, most of the stuff that we're talking about is not the painful total knee within the first three to six months, obviously. That can be a number of different things. Right. And you do see some of those in your practice, too. But this is more of the painful total knee after a year, two years of recovery where they really shouldn't have any sort of post-surgical pain lingering. Um, and so the first thing, and it shouldn't really have an effusion. Um, or anything like that. So if someone's got a, a, a remarkable effusion, that you know, that's an indicator to me that there could be something going on. Um, and then I, you know, I check the knee. I check their active and passive range of motion. You know, do they have an extension lag? Do they have a decreased range of motion? Do they have, um, you know, difference between active and their passive range of motion? Um, is their patella tracking well? Uh, check stability. Varus valgus stability, 0, 30, 90 degrees. Um, one thing I like to do uh, is I have the patient sit on the edge of the bed and, and let their uh, leg hang free with the bed elevated um, so that the weight of their leg is uh, pulling down sort of in flexion, like a, a tension flexion test. And, uh, and I basically see how much play there is in the knee. Um, and it, you'd, you'd be shocked at how much play there is in, in some of these people's knees and they have pain that they describe and it seems like flexion stability. Um, and so that's uh, one, one uh, uh, test I like to I like to do. Um, and then uh, I think palpation is is huge. Uh, the most common reasons why people have pain after knee replacement, um, it's not infection, it's not um, loosening, it's it's IT band syndrome or pes bursitis, uh, patellar tendonitis. Those are the reasons why people will have new onset pain. They have this new knee that they love. They're starting to get into some new activities and they get some overuse phenomena around their knee and they. Um, IT band syndrome, I, I joke, if there's one thing I could remove from uh, anatomy that would make my life a lot easier, it'd be the IT band. You know, the band <laughs> yeah. me. Right. People have the, people just have IT band syndrome, they have stroke and teric bursitis, and it's just, it's this problematic thing. Nobody ever stretches well enough, and it just causes yeah. problems. People increase their activity. So um, it's a very, if someone's got pain, as you push on Gertie's tubercle, um, and no, no pain was really anything else than the mech that's IT band syndrome. And you don't necessarily need to go that much further um, down the rabbit hole of, of your diagnostic uh, workup. Um, and gait analysis, I think this is huge. Um, you want to see if people have um, significant limp or if they have any weakness. And one of the things that gait, one of the things that's not really on here, I don't know if it's on the next slide, probably the most important exam you can do aside from range of motion stability palpation, inspection of the, of the knee, is examining the ipsilateral hip. Because there are so many patients that you see in clinic that complain of knee pain around a total knee replacement, and they just have, they have a, uh, you know, severe arthritis in their ipsilateral hip, and it's just referred pain down to their knee. Particularly when patients describe a diffuse pain, and they can't really identify where they feel the pain, they just kind of put their hand over their distal femur, and they say it hurts down here. And then you do a resisted straight leg raise test or you flex them up and internally rotate and they complain of knee pain with those maneuvers and, and really the problem is the hip. So in those patients, I will absolutely get a uh, weight-bearing pelvis x-ray to make sure they don't have uh, moderate to severe hip arthritis. Um, so that kind of plays with gait analysis. Um, you check their weakness, you can also assess for, for hip um, pathology with that gait analysis. Yeah, I actually... Um... 
had a question come up about that earlier today. I got to go do, <laughs> I got to go look up an article about gate, uh, just kind of gait analysis and the different types of gait, antalgic, uh, right. uh, trend Ellenberg and short limb, you know, all types of different things I got to look up tonight. Cody keeping me up super late. Not you, Dr. Cody, the other Cody. <laughs> the other not, Cody. Not you. Confusing the, yeah, my, my little man, Cody. No, <laughs> uh, and the next step is, Ideally, next up, probably, you know, at some point we're going to talk about labs as well. But as far as imaging, what are you looking for uh, in this particular case in someone coming in with a painful total knee? What are you looking for? And actually, I, I recently read an article that I thought was very good. I uh, can't really remember who wrote it. I think it was like 2014. And Arthur name was Kumar. But it was about uh, things to look for in a post-op total knee. And can we just kind of mention that as well? Because I could, I could see how they all could play a role. Things that you're looking for anytime after you do a total knee arthroplasty, and things that you may highlight a little bit more when they're having pain. Yeah, and spend as much time as you want on this because I think this is um, really important to be able to kind of evaluate X-rays and um, know what you're looking for and know what is when something's wrong. Yeah, I agree. I think um, you know. X-rays can tell a lot about how a surgery went and whether or not there was a struggle and um, how a patient's doing. So uh, they don't tell the whole story, but they certainly tell the story. And I think that uh, critical evaluation of X-rays, your own and other people's, are a huge part of uh, evaluating these patients. So um, the first thing I look at is, is uh, I know these are usually short-legged X-rays. Not everybody gets a scanogram on everyone. Um, I, I typically do not get a scanogram unless I see that there's some sort of a major alignment issue on, on exam or um, if I see they've got some anatomic variation on their short-legged x-rays, I'll get a scanogram on the initial visit, but I won't always get that on people. But if there's, you just look for overall alignment, make sure that uh, on the x-rays, if it's weight-bearing, you can see if there's a uh, balance or even polyethylene wear. Um, you should not see significant gapping on one side or the other. Um, it can be indicative of uh, poor balancing or asymmetrical polyethylene wear. Um, really, you shouldn't see a lot of overgrowth around the sides of the component. So uh, it's harder to see on the femur, but on the tibia, you'll, you'll see um, if someone has a loose component, um, you, you kind of want to look where the implants are relative to the regular bony landmarks. So a primary total knee replacement, the, le the depth of resection uh, should not be below the, the fibular head, the tip of the fibula. So. If you see somebody and they've got what looks like what you think might be heterotopic ossification or bone overgrowth that you will talk about around the lateral side of the tray and the tray, the level of the, or the thought that the level of resection is below the tip of the fibula, that implant is probably loose um, and it's actually subsided. It's not bone overgrowth, but rather the implant is plowed into the, the lateral plateau. So mm -hmm. I look with uh, you know, respect to other bony landmarks, you look at the joint line. Um, you know, different, uh, you know, from the medial epicondyle, you want to make sure that you can see if the femur's loose. Um, that's mostly on the AP, uh, you can look at those sorts of things. Um, and then you want to look for things, especially in an older knee like the one we see here, uh, you know, there's no significant polyethylene wear that you can see, uh, but you can see, you know, a, a geographic lesion that you can draw your finger around and that proximal tibial metaphysis indicative of, of significant osteolysis you can see in the femur as well. Um, now, these implants don't appear loose to me, but uh, for sure, this uh, osteolysis causes synovitis, and that osteolysis can be painful. So, um, you know, these are reasons that can uh, explain the patient's pain. And when um, you say appear loose, what do you mean? What, like, what do you mean by that? What on the x-ray would show you, okay, well, this implant appears loose. Yeah. Like, you see the osteolysis, <laughs> but... Yeah, I think for, for testing purposes, they would either have to show you an implant that is just uh, grossly malpositioned with regard to normal bony landmarks, like a tibia that has one centimeter of bone all the way around, you know, it, it, it appears to have subsided about a centimeter or something like that. If they're going to show you static x-ray or if they're going to show you um, loosening, what they really, what you really want to see is um, you really want to see serial x-rays. So implant change in position with time is diagnostic of implant loosening. So ah, okay. if you get an x-ray and the tibia is, you know, at one degree of varus, and you get an x-ray one year later, and that tibia is in four degrees of varus, and that tibia is loose. Um, so there's uh, that would be something that you would look for. Um, 
to me, you can look for radiolucencies around the implants. And I think that's, um, that is important. You can sometimes see if you've got a bad varus knee and you do a decent correction, you have some uh, uh, sclerotic bone medially, you can sometimes see uh, radiolucency underneath the medial tibial tray that sort of gets a little bit worse in the first six months to a year, but then it stays stable and you don't really see it progress. Um, so there are some what we'll call physiologic radiolucency, but you just don't want to see that progressing around the keel and around to the lateral side. You don't want to see a full circumferential radiolucency. Um, Okay. And then you're looking for the alignment. You want to make sure overall the knee is, is well aligned here. I like showing the different uh, relationships here. I look at that a lot. The relationships of the medial lateral epicondyles to the joint line, um, the overall alignment of the knee, whether or not the components are in appropriate alignment, how much slope is on the uh, implants. If you go back to the previous x-ray, um, you know, sometimes you can see patients that slope looks appropriate to me, but sometimes you'll see patients, the AP looks great, and then you go to the lateral and there's 13 degrees of posterior tibial slope. Um, or you can see that they don't have a lot of uh, posterior condylar offset, uh, meaning they've undersized their implant and, and taken too large of a posterior resection, and they have probably flexion extension mismatch with uh, flexion instability. Uh, those are important things to notice. Um, you want to see... Um, if people have significantly restricted range of motion, you know, very, uh, you see the Shenton's line in the back of the femur here. Did, they, did the surgeon leave a very large osteophyte in the back of the knee that's impinging posteriorly? That can be painful, cause decreased range of motion. Uh, you want to look at the value of the patella, the patella baja or alta. Um, and then uh, those are, that's pretty thorough evaluation. Um, yeah. as I'm trying to think about it here. Um, and then obviously you see any sort of uh, any static representation of a dynamic problem, meaning like if you have a knee that is clearly out of balance, like, uh, you know, gapped open laterally um, on a standing AP, then, then you obviously have concerns for, um, for instability. Yep. And I actually, in, in the middle, middle of this, I've looked it up. Cause I really thought it was a good article and it was kind of going through the same things that you, you were just mentioning. It's uh, how to interpret, interpret post-operative x-rays after total knee arthroplasty. And the author name was Kumar, K-U-M-A-R. Yeah. Pretty sure you can probably find it in Google. Uh, but that was an excellent, I think that was a good way to go through the, the x-rays. And uh, is there ever a time where you, you consider doing like a CT? Yes, absolutely. So uh, if somebody has, uh, there's two, two times that I think about it. Number one, this is a great uh, example here, patellar instability. I think people have, uh, not everybody, some people have an issue with uh, rotation of their components. And you see that sometimes with um, uh, symmetrical tibial components. Some people want to maximize tibial coverage. And the way to do that oftentimes is to internally rotate the tibial component uh, relative to um, where where you should have it, which is a I I like to rotate to external rotate my tibial component to the junction of the medial middle third of the tibial tubercle. Um, you know, so you, if you internally rotate your tibia, you can upsize your tibial component, and you can get great bony coverage. But you have an internally rotated tibia, and I think uh, that leads to a lot of patellar mal tracking problems. So um, I I typically use an implant that has a symmetrical tibial base plate, but I understand mm -hmm. that. Um, Sometimes you have some posterior medial tibial uncoverage uh, when you're placing your tibial component, and that's okay. Um, this rotation is very important. So uh, I talk about this with our residents uh, all the time, and um, I think my chief resident class uh, probably is sick and tired of hearing me talk about these things. But um, you know, looking at the rotation of the femoral component, how do you assess rotation? And, and um, I'm an anterior referencing guy, um, but you know you can get to the same goal uh, regardless of how you do the knee. And um, the goal is to have that implant rotated, the femoral component, so it is parallel to the um, transipicondylar axis. So whether you're using white sides or the transipicondylar axis or the posterior condylar axis, um, to set your rotation, that's the goal, is to, to be uh, parallel to that TEA, uh, perpendicular to the AP axis of the femur. Um, and so the femoral rotation is important, the tibial rotation is important. In those cases where someone has pain, or if I get the sunrise view and they've got, a, um, it appears like uh, their patella is really uh, either subluxated or, or high, you're, you're, uh, tips way up uh, laterally, um, 
or they could have some lateral patellar impingement and they have pain along the anterolateral knee. Uh, that can be a reason to get a CT scan to evaluate your component rotation for sure. Okay. And I, I still have a hard time kind of understanding that, uh, uh, just the whole how to assess rotation and it, it, it can get very tricky, but uh, it's something I'm working on. I'm glad that you took a little time to go through that and I'm sure you're uh, your residents probably appreciate it because it, I don't think it's the easiest thing to grasp really. It's, no, it's uh, not. Yeah. So uh, I think that the, the reason is there's so many different ways to do it. And it's funny, admittedly, I, you know, a few months into my fellowship, I saw several different ways to do knee replacement. I thought I just don't understand knee replacement at all because people are very dogmatic about how they do things. And mm-hmm. you hear one person say, this is the way you do it. And then you hear the next person say, Oh no, you definitely do it that way. You definitely always do it this other way. <laughs> right. <laughs> And, and they all have good outcomes. And so it just didn't seem to make that much sense to me. So I, I sort of focus on um, you know, you're teaching the, the goals. Like what's your, what's your ultimate goal for this implant positioning? And then no matter how you decide to get to that goal, as long as you get to the goal, then, then the knee will turn out just fine. And so um, some people will just balance the gaps and, and cut a 90 degree tibial cut and then uh, set their rectangular flexion gap and, and go for it. Um, as long as you have a perpendicular cut on your tibia every time, then you're probably going to be fine with that. Um, you know, but there's always, you always want to make sure that, uh, especially if you are, you know, more of a minimally invasive uh, type of surgeon, that's hard sometimes to see the epicondyles in your, in your wound. So um, you've got to be very cognizant of implant rotation. Um, you know, when you make your cuts in a, in a, in a, um, Total knee, there, there are certain clues you have. Um, let's say you can't see the epicondyles because you're doing a minimally invasive exposure. Um, you, know, you can look at white sides. It's not always that accurate. Posterior condylar axis is a little less accurate. Um, but you're, you're cutting, uh, you cut your anterior cut, and you don't see that nice grand piano sign. Um, that could be right. a clue that you're internally rotated. You know, yeah. I think the best last check for me is because I, I sort of cut an anterior flat cut first, which sets my rotation, and then I have a, a four-in-one cut block that sort of sits on the end of the femur um, and anteriorly. And I look at my posterior condylar resection, and for most knees, you should be taking a larger medial cut posteriorly than laterally. So if that cut is even or you're taking more laterally than medially, then you're probably internally rotated. And, and so um, you can see these uh, if you you can avoid trouble yourself doing primary knees, but you can also see these types of things on a CT scan if you get it and you see there's a seven or eight or nine degree internal or external rotation deformity of the posterior condyles of your femur compared to the trans of condylar axis. And and that can be a a significant cause of pain, particularly if patients, you know, their patella may not be dislocating, but they may be constantly stressing their um, extensor mechanism and and causing lateral patellar impingement and things like that. So um, uh, Dr. Berger out of Rush has a, has a paper on uh, evaluation of CT scans and, and painful total knees. That's a really good paper to review. Definitely. We will um, definitely check that out. And I, again, thanks. That was a great explanation of regarding CT scans and even how to look at it and how to you know, assess implant rotation, which can be a cause of the of painful total knee. Now, Dr. Cody, say that this patient came in and they said, um, I was doing fine. I got some dental work done a couple of weeks ago, and now my knee has been swollen. I've had a couple of fevers, this is kind of low grade fevers, and you look and you examine them and you see they kind of have some erythema, they have a knee effusion, um, you know, their knee is a little bit red. Uh, what, what, and typically, you know, after that we may possibly aspirate it, but can you tell us a little bit more about the workup of, uh, of that in that case and then what lab uh, markers you'll draw and what you're looking for in the lab values? I think uh, this is always a, this is a, I feel like this this target is always shifting, but there's there's some constants that that I maintain um, as far as the gold standards of treatment and stuff. There are some other labs that that people will draw um, more for academic and intellectual curiosity. But as far as testing purposes are concerned, I think the place to start is an ESR and CRP for sure. Um, if you have a high clinical suspicion for infection, it is not unreasonable to aspirate right away. If someone's got a large effusion with erythema, fevers. And, uh, you know, that reported history, um, because by the time you send them out for labs and they get their labs and the labs come back, I mean, you could be several days uh, away from getting an answer. And then you have to aspirate, you're just delaying treatment. If you have a high clinical suspicion, I think aspiration at the time of the first visit is absolutely warranted. 
Um, but ES on CRP is sort of the gold standard. People can draw D-dimers. Some people will draw things like, uh, you can get like IL-6 and things like that. Um, those have not uh, found their way as being that useful in my practice uh, at this point. Um, but uh, you know, the new sort of MSIS criteria um, by uh, Parvizi uh, and, and his group, uh, that chart, sort of the weighted chart of different um, lab values and, and, uh, and things, that's, that's been very, very helpful. And I think that every surgeon who does joint replacement should have that chart. And I think every resident should have that chart uh, cut out and pasted on their uh, you know, workstation uh, wherever they are to, to evaluate that. But ESR and CRP are, are good lab markers. If either of them is elevated, um, I will aspirate. Um, and then I send the fluid, you send the fluid for um, everything you said here. Yep, uh, Synovi white blood cell count with differential. If someone has uh, any concern that there might be some metal on metal wear in the knee, so if they've worn all the way through their polyethylene, and the implants, you know, sometimes you see severe poly wear and the knee is almost dislocated and um, that femoral component will be hitting uh, you know, metal tibia. Um, in that case, anytime there could be a chance for metal on metal um, debris, you want to get a manual uh, differential and that's definitely a testable topic. You see that in the hip. If someone has, uh, if someone has a metal on metal hip, um, sometimes the cell count will be um, falsely elevated because the machine gets confused by the metal ions. You want a manual differential for that. Um, and then uh, you definitely don't want the patient to have been on any antibiotics recently that can affect your cultures primarily. You can still have an elevated cell count if someone's been on a few days of antibiotics, but in general, your cleanest um, aspiration is going to be off of antibiotics for at least two weeks um, to have good culture data. Um, the cell counts, and I think lar more and more alpha defensin is becoming, I don't want to say gold standard, but it's becoming a very, um, very useful test uh, for periparathetic joint infection. It's not something that's needed every time, so one thing that I will do is just from a functional standpoint, um, is to send out lab for us, so I will have my residents send uh, cell count um, and culture and everything for our in-house labs, and if the cell count is in a gray area, like let's say, you have 1,300 white blood cells with 63% or 65% polys, I'll, I'll then go ahead and have them send the alpha defense and test in. Um, but if I get the aspiration, you know, they'll, they'll have everything put in the vials and everything and set up for alpha defense. In. But if I get my cell count back and it's 40,000 white cells, I don't need alpha defense in for that. It's infected. Um, yeah. So I, I think that's... Um, one thing that's been been helpful, uh, but you can see here the number is so the the greater than 1154 percent neutrophils. That's sort of the lowest suggestive infection numbers. It's not doesn't mean that everybody above that um, had a very high rate of infection, but um, but below that was relatively um, predictive of not having an infection. That's what you're yeah that's what you're saying there yeah. So, so if you were below that threshold, it is pretty clear that you do not have a joint infection. If you are slightly above that threshold, it doesn't mean you have one. It just means that you can kind of look at all of your, your data and add up all those points on that MSI scale and, yeah, and compare yeah. everything that you're looking at. Um, and then uh, within three weeks or three to four weeks of an acute, uh, if you're trying to evaluate someone with an aspiration in the first you know, four to six weeks after surgery, yes, that, that number is going to be higher. Um, I've seen yeah, I've seen lots of numbers for that, but uh, you know, ten thousand, you know, over ten thousand for a knee, and up to thirty thousand times for a hip can be normal in the first four to six weeks after surgery. So, um, appearance of the fluid is actually not that um, predictive of infection. So you draw the fluid out, you can say, "Oh, this looks great," and then it's infected, or you say, "Oh, this looks like absolute pus," and then it's not infected. And uh, so that's why the appearance of purulence on uh, the MS cri MSIS criteria is not a direct, is not um, a major criteria for infection. Okay. Uh, I do not like CBCs. So when someone tells me someone's white count, unless they're septic in the ICU, their white blood cell count is not that helpful. To me. Yeah. Okay. And, you know, I think all those were really good topics to bring up that you, that you mentioned. And, just thinking like in the clinical setting at this point, we, we likely have a pretty decent idea of what's going on or, or hopefully we have an idea of what's causing this pain. Um, 
the next portion on as far as the slides, we just brought up pretty much intrinsic versus extrinsic causes. And we just have kind of a list of, of the different kinds because sure. it seemed like, like you were saying kind of early on, those, that's one of the things you have to kind of determine between is it an infection? Is it something within the joint? It could be something totally outside of the knee causing this pain. Uh, so we just have a couple things listed. But uh, what are some of the, I guess, more common things that you see outside of infection, of course? I know we said osteolysis uh, and aseptic loosening for the, the later stages when they come back with pain later on. But other than that, what are some of the things that you, you sometimes see for, for knee pain? So there's, um, there's real world and there's the test. So on yeah. the test, the most common things you see are infection, osteolysis, loosening, patellar maltracking, um, and then they may show you some flexion instability with the knee partially dislocated or something like that. Um, in real life, in real clinic, that's, that's actually not the most common thing you see for painful total knee. The most common things you see are, um, you see a lot of, uh, extrinsic causes like IT band syndrome, patellar tendonitis, PES bursitis, things that get better with PT. Um, you yeah. see a lot of hip arthritis. Um, uh, I see, uh, you know, so most of the things you see are not really mechanical that can be fixed with the revision, which is, um, it, it can be actually frustrating for patients because they want it, they want they want there to be something wrong with the knee so that you as a surgeon can say, oh, I know what I can fix and I can make it better. Um, not every patient really wants to hear that, oh, it's a physical therapy thing and you need six to eight weeks of physical therapy that, to get better. Like, right. um, uh, or that I don't know what's going on. So I think that these are all, um, these are where, these are things that you have to be careful about and, and be a little bit of an investigator with regard to your physical exam. Um, back to the previous slide real quick. I want to make sure I didn't miss any of those. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talked about instability, arthrofibrosis. That's just a pain. That's just a, that's more painful for surgeons. It's painful for patients too. But um, those cases, are <laughs> tough ca they're tough cases. Um, I, I will give people an uh, I will give people a revision, one revision for arthrofibrosis. Uh, but some people just get stiff, and there's you know you can do everything mechanically you can, and they're just going to be stiff, and they're they're just, those are difficult discussions to have. Um, implant impingement. Um, yeah, I mean, you can kind of see that sometimes. It's pretty rare, I think. Um, extensor mechanism uh, disorders, that's a catastrophic complication. Um, it's usually not a, a cause of pain unless someone has a, uh, sometimes what you can see is, uh, you know, if you make your arthrotomy too close to the patella, um, you don't have a good uh, soft tissue sleeve, that arthrotomy can rupture. And that functions a little bit like an extensor mechanism disruption where the patient is unable to extend the knee. They can't do a straight leg raise. But if you actually hold the patella reduced over the femur, they can actually do a straight leg raise and they can extend their knee. Um, but when you take your hand away, the patella dislocates. So um, sometimes patellar instability due to implant malrotation. Sometimes it's due to frank failure of the arthrotomy. So um, that's something to kind of look for. Um, extension mechanism allograft. Uh, this is a, a topic that um, is a little bit of a hot topic now, I think. Um, I might be on the older school side of things, which is uh, weird for me, but it's a, uh, I, I have been more of an allograft type of, uh, type of person when it comes to these, uh, fixing these sorts of things. But, um, I think more and more people are using mesh, uh, to, to augment their repair of, uh, extension mechanism disruption. Yeah, no, one, so, one of but, our attendings says that. Yeah. And it's a, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great thing because, uh, no matter what you use, whatever whatever you use, you want to make sure you use it uh, well. Um, and you're basically creating more area for collagen and stronger suture grabbing. And you just want to make sure that whatever you do, it, it um, decreases, uh, you know, uh, lengthening of your repair. So um, whatever you do, you want to do something. I think on the test, the answer is, and in real life, you shouldn't just do a direct repair. If you have a total knee in place and you have an extension mechanism disruption, you need to augment it with something, whether it's allograft or some sort of mesh. Um, you can't just do a direct repair, it will fail. Okay. I think we have some more um, x-rays of some of the other intrinsic causes that we could uh, sure thing, close yeah. up and yeah. touch oh, about sure some of the things this. that we see. Yeah, yeah. You, you sure hope that you see uh, it on the test if they're asking question of stability that you see that x-ray on the left there. That uh, pretty much <laughs> tells you what's going on. Um, I think um, 
implant impingement here. This is, this is very common. That person on the right side has, uh, you know, clearly has um, significant patella baja. And in flexion, what happens is that patellar button will impinge on the tibial polyethylene or um, the patella will actually impinge on the, like the native patella will impinge on the tibial polyethylene. It's painful. Um, so uh, this is a, that's a tough problem to address with knee replacement. Um, there are things you can do with revision surgery to distalize the joint line, um, adding in some augments, taking a little deeper tibial cut. Um, but you, you, can, you can only do so much because you will run the risk of, uh, uh, of significant flexion extension mismatch. Um, so, but, you know, clearly patellar impingement there um, on, the, on the right is what's, uh, what's going on. And I think this is probably our last one that we're going to have for those who are watching on YouTube. But um, so this is so common on the test questions and things like that. Can you kind of see some of the signs that you're looking for when you're, when you're suspecting possible osteolysis or, uh, and also loosening as well? You have uh, one here that's loose also. Yeah, let me see. I sort of lost our, uh, oh, there it is. Yeah. So um, asymmetrical, uh, you see asymmetrical polyethylene wear. Um, you see those large osteolytic lesions. Um, you also see some radiolucency around the tibial component too. So um, those are all things that I would critically evaluate in that left x-ray. Um, and this is a great example that uh, the middle x-ray, um, you know, you, you really don't think the surgeon put that implant in like that. So if you got this, this x-ray, I would say, you know, I don't, I would trust that most surgeons wouldn't put this implant in 15 to 20 degrees of error. So um, that's probably loose. <laughs> yeah, you don't necessarily have to um, have serial x-rays for that. Um, you've clearly lost a lot of medial plateau here and, uh, and that implant is loose. So um, loosening on the femur is actually pretty hard to see. You've got to, you've got to really look out for it. Um, and this is a great example, the x-ray all the way to the right here. Anteriorly, you can see anterior and posteriorly, you can see, oh, sometimes people will explain that away and say, oh, it's just some reactive bone overgrowth. But probably what's, ha what's happened there is that tibia has subsided a centimeter. Um, you know, so that when I see that in a painful total knee, I, I worry about uh, subsidence. I don't automatically assume that it's overgrowth of bone. Um, ah. Some people can get some reactive bone overgrowth. Um, in one area of the knee, but if you see it circumferentially, obviously that's, that's cause for concern. Not gonna lie, I didn't even catch that. And uh, we put the slides, up, and we put those pictures out there. But um, yeah, no, that's a great, great finding right there. So you're saying Absolutely. that that um that little bony overgrowth, that's why that'll clue you in towards some some side and so the tibia, yeah, right there where you're. Well, we think about it, especially if it's especially if it's anterior. I mean, it's very hard to leave a lip of anterior bone when you're doing a knee replacement. You know, you yeah. cut a flat tibia and you put it on top of a flat tibia. If all of a sudden that implant is now covered in bone anteriorly, it, it should clue you in that uh, it could be a technical error. You know, maybe the implant was undersized. Um, but regardless, I think that um, you've got to be concerned that implant is loose. And the big things that clue you into it being osteolysis versus the aseptic loosening is you kind of look at the poly and see if there's any wear between that. Is that that is that kind of correct? Yeah. Yes, um, it doesn't take a lot of poly wear to have large osteolysis, large amounts of osteolysis. So I think, um, you know, I, I have been surprised by osteolysis at revision. Um, luckily, it was not anything that we couldn't manage with our normal um, revision techniques. But um, y you know, you can you can see uh, significant osteolysis with. Um, almost an overlooked amount of polyethylene wear on the radiograph. So if you have a millimeter of difference, you may just quickly look at the x-rays and say, oh, there's no significant poly wear. But that's why you really have to critically evaluate the x-rays and look for osteolytic lesions. Um, and if you're careful, you'll see them. Um, they're, they're usually, uh, if they're large enough to, to cause a problem for reconstruction, you should see them on x-ray. I mean, you don't necessarily have to get a CT scan on, on all these cases, but if you see a large lesion, and you're concerned about fixation, I think that's an indication to get a CT scan just to evaluate what bone you have left for fixation um, uh, if you're revising these components. So I think um, you can see uh, significant osteolysis without significant polyethylene wear. I would think for testing purposes, they tend to show an x-ray kind of like the one all the way to the left where they, there is you know, yeah. recognizable 
uneven polyethylene wear. Absolutely. Yep. I'm glad you mentioned all of those because, you know, early on, I, I would be looking at this and still not <laughs> recognizing what's what's going on. So I think it was really good. Real, real, yeah, I mean, it's right in your face, but if you haven't seen it and it, it maybe has someone to kind of explain it to you, uh, it, it, you know, it, it'll miss you, even though it's hitting you right in the face. Yeah, even though um, things like the virus and all that, like, you know, it just takes a little while. But no, I, I completely agree. Absolutely. And so, uh, Dr. Cody, thank you very much for this topic. I think this one is a uh, high yield for both clinical purposes and also test taking. Uh, so I feel like, uh, you know, a lot of different people and different levels of orthopedics will, will be able to appreciate this talk. I uh, really appreciate your time. Uh, before we go, we usually like to give our guests a chance to uh, give out any social media tags or email address or anything like that that they might want to share with our listeners. For sure. Uh, I, I am on uh, the Twitter sphere at, uh, at JPCodyMD. <laughs> um, and uh, I do a lot of, uh, I do a lot of, I try to get involved uh, with Twitter doing a lot of ortho stuff. Um, I have some other uh, interests on, on Twitter that you can go ahead and find out about, but uh, nice. more and more actually what's been kind of fun is my, my uh, more senior level residents are involved in social media. And I think it's a pretty powerful tool to be honest. Uh, I, I learn a lot about uh, some different cases that people present and I'll go through uh, some threads and everything. And there's some pretty brilliant surgeons out there uh, that come with very creative ways to deal with, uh, you know, some common and some uncommon problems. And, um, and it's just a really uh, nice way to sort of uh, crowdsource ideas. And, um, and uh, Al Walter Reed Bethesda and uh, our, our chief resident class in general is uh, they're all over Twitter. So it's a, um, uh, they wanted me to, to put a plug in for the program and everything, but, um, but yeah, give us a follow and, uh, and reach out. And if you have any questions or anything, uh, I'm happy to answer uh, any questions people have. I love going through difficult cases and complex primaries, uh, difficult revision cases, uh, orthopedics is, is, uh, it's my job. It's also my hobby. So I really just, uh, I like nerding out about this stuff. So I really appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to to come on here and talk about it uh, with you guys. Um, hopefully, I've swayed a couple of residents into going into arthroplasty. It's in my, I think it's the best field. Uh, I love what I do, um, and uh, we work really hard. But we also like to have a lot of fun too. So, um, if you're thinking about joints, and anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm happy to talk to you. Well, Dr. Cody, thank you again so much for coming on. All right, it's my pleasure.